Mike, and this is the State of Mind podcast. It's usually on Radio Regent Park, but because of the current pandemic, it's uh, at home and lockdown, and this is the first time I've ever done it virtually. And today, I have a very special guest, Eric Pierni, who is the founder and director and et cetera of Men Therapy Toronto. I'll let him introduce himself. Um, but just for, I guess, transparency, transparency uh, I'm doing my practicum for my master's at the clinic. So Eric is, is my supervisor and boss, and he's graciously agreed to do this interview, um, which is awesome. So Eric, can you please um, introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about your story of how you created the clinic and anything else um, you think is pertinent to share. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Mike. So uh, my name is Eric Pierney. I'm a registered uh, psychotherapist and a certified sex addiction therapist. And as you mentioned, I'm the owner of Men Therapy Toronto, which is a, a treatment a counseling center for, for men, uh, where we offer individual psychotherapy for men and group uh, psychotherapy and it's something I started in uh, in 2016 so it's about four years now that we've been up and going and um, yeah the concept started when I was in university so basically I was prior to what I'm doing now I was in a corporate background and then I left the corporate background and I decided to go into this area of psychotherapy which was always particularly important to me uh, at the time when I started I didn't actually realize I would be focusing on men. Uh, really, my interest was on men's mental health issues. So a lot of the research that I was working on in university, my papers, subjects I was interested in, was around men's mental health. But it didn't dawn on me that this is what I would be doing as a practice. Uh, basically, the context was I was sitting in my lectures and I was surprised. I mean, I knew colloquially that there were more women than men in this field. But when I was in the classes and I realized, wow, I'm really like an outlier here. So I'd be in some of the lectures. I would be either the only man there. Uh, maybe there would be one or two. And I was quite surprised by that. Uh, and then I started thinking about, you know, how, how we think about psychotherapy for men. Uh, so I was thinking about, well, wait, there aren't a lot of male therapists out there. And then there's this classic idea that men don't ask for help. And I started playing around with that. In the business world, we used to have this expression of sacred cows, where sometimes you have a sacred cow, which is an idea that everybody believes about business, that they just operate as if it's true. But it may not actually be true. And so in my case, I started to play around with the idea is it possible that men don't ask for help is not actually accurate? Is it possible that one of the issues is that we don't really make or tend to put a lot of emphasis on making help for men very accessible? And so I started to think that maybe the issue was a question of accessibility. And so I started to play around and I started thinking, well, are there any centers that are really focusing on men and men's mental health? The issue that I had at the time was that my whole idea was really just about trying to make it accessible to men, right? So there is no difference in efficacy if a man is sitting with a female therapist or a male therapist. It does not make a difference at all. However, there may be a subset of men that are actually maybe interested in working with a male therapist, or maybe they're even afraid to work with a male therapist, and that probably means that's an area they should be focusing on. But those men, if that's there for them, where would they find access to these male therapists? And so that was kind of the whole idea behind uh, Men Therapy Toronto Counseling Services for Men. Uh, and that's, that's how it started. So that was the genesis of it all. And can you talk, tell us, woo, that's loud. I can hear the feedback on your side a little bit. Okay, that's better. Um, I guess, what is it that, 
uh, motivated you to leave the corporate work and enter into this? So did you leave your corporate work and then go to school and then start it? Or was the, were you in school while still doing the corporate stuff? Or how did that transition happen? No, I was, I was in corporate life and, you know, I had periods through my corporate experience where they were better and other periods where they weren't as good. And then I started to notice that I was going through my own stuff. I mean, this had been going on early on and I started trying to reach out for help. And for me at the time, when I was going through it, I was actually looking for a male therapist to work with. And I could not believe how hard it was for me to find one. Um, Cause I just felt like there were certain issues. I wanted to hear from a man's perspective. I, I was not, I was just more, just to see, could the guy relate? Am I completely alone in how I'm feeling about certain subjects? Um, so that was going on with me. And then I started to get the help. I started even to participate in men's groups and I started to feel better. Uh, Sorry, but did you I find a male therapist? I did. I did. I did. Eventually, okay. I, I did. And then I, I started to feel uh, better. But then I started to kind of hook on to this idea that maybe the ultimate kind of nirvana to feeling the way I really wanted to feel was being successful. I, I started to kind of buy into that. So I started feeling better in terms of I was getting help. But then I kind of let it go a little bit. And I started getting really wrapped up in this idea of success. And then the more I started to become outwardly successful, the more it was starting to be clear to me that that wasn't changing any of my interior dynamic. And then I got even more invested in doing the internal work. And so this had been a long process of me kind of learning about myself, being introspective and kind of developing that whole side of myself that I was really gravitating towards. And then as my corporate career was getting more successful, I was noticing that I was managing bigger and bigger teams. And by the end, uh, I was in the tech space. And in that space, we had a lot of predominantly men. So I would be having a lot of my one-on-one -on -one with my direct reports. And I started to notice that I was almost more interested in that aspect of the business. Because for me, my goal was to help these guys and my team fulfill their potential. Now, that would help me from a business perspective because if they were performing at their best, it would, it would help me. But then what, what I also noticed happening is that the guys would feel better when there's someone where they can really trust that the managers got their back. And so that was, that was the, the kind of underpinning context. But I never thought of myself that I wanted to be a therapist. That never dawned on me. What happened was, I loved my job I, and I really still love the space. And I got to a place where I was like, oh, I think I want to do something different. This is one of the things that I noticed comes into my office. When I left my corporate job, I was happy. It wasn't a question like I left because I was unhappy. I was so fortunate because I worked with some real superstars and these people are now some of the most significant people, at least in the Canadian tech space. And it was amazing to watch them work because what I was noticing was that they were so great at what they were doing. And I never felt any real jealousy for them. I just knew that for myself, I wasn't that in this space. I was good at what I did. I wasn't great. And so these people, I saw what it was like to work with people who were great at what they did. And so that started to give me the idea that there might be something else out there that I'm great at. But so that's what I was after. I was after kind of fulfilling my potential, but I was also really happy in my work. I mean, I was so happy to the extent that when I decided that I was going to quit and I didn't know what I was going to do next. You know, they came up to me and they offered me an opportunity to stay for, I think it was four to six months more and pay me this like significant bonus just to stay longer. And I did just because I was like, yeah, sure, that's great. 
And then the first thing, and then the first thing I did after I quit is that I had been living in Toronto, and my family is originally from Montreal. My mother and father lived there, and I literally had this feeling of I wanted to get to know who these two people were. Who are these people? Like who is who's my mother and father? And so I just moved to Montreal and I stayed there for six months. And so uh, and just getting to know my parents. And at the time, I still have no idea about what I'm going to do next in my life. Right. And so what I had been doing is I thought that because I helped build a business from zero to where it had become pretty significant, I said, maybe I can try to do that again. And so what I was doing is I was going to Silicon Valley in California because I was in the tech space and I was meeting with startups and I was trying to think of which startup would be a great startup that we can take in Canada. And at the time I was focusing a lot on the food area and com like companies that were doing uh, what, you know, food box delivery, that type of stuff. I, I was interested in that, that area. And I was going back and forth. So I went three, four times to California, but the whole time I'm journaling, I'm reading about the inter interior world. I'm reading books on uh, psychology. I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking about that as an interest. I'm not even recognizing how significant a part of my life it is. And then one day I was in Montreal and I was journaling to myself about, you know, well, what am I going to do next? And, uh, I mean, there was another more significant piece that happened, but I was journaling about what I'm going to do next. And then I realized, I was like, oh boy, I think I might actually be more aligned with doing this type of work, this work of being a therapist. And I remember where I was when I wrote that in my journal. And I remember I was so upset. I was like, that's not who I want to be. I don't want to be that guy like, I want to be the successful corporate guy. Like, no, 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 no. And I just kind of wrote it and I kind of went away from it. And then it was so hard to picture my friends and ex-colleagues, what they would think about me. I could, I could literally envision them rolling their eyes. Like, oh God, Eric, come on, you're going to really do that. Uh, and so, but then once that seed landed, it, 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 it kind of, I couldn't take it out. And then that was the impetus for saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and, and do this work. Um, I remember you just, you, asked, you told me about when you would do check-ins with uh, team members, you had that chart and you said, where on this line do you think yeah. you're fulfilling your potential? It's funny too, in retrospect, that, line is similar to the uh, outcome rating scale, the session rating scale for therapists, you know, it's like similar. <laughs> yeah, it's true, yeah. <laughs> um, in a sense that, I guess, so the question that I never really thought of is that what you were doing in a sense was a form of, like the question I'm trying to think of is the similarities and also where the boundary is between being uh, psychologically or, or supportive to employees in a workplace. Um, but it's not therapy, obviously. Um, and so that is a little bit of a side note, but that's a huge part of the workplace mental health conversations that are going on right now in the world. Um, do you think that there's a, I don't know how else to ask. Like, I don't even know what I'm thinking of asking because I've never really thought about it in that way. But does that, like, well, can I'll, you take I'll, I'll that explain, little? I'll explain how I thought about it at the time. Okay. Right. As a manager at the time, how I thought about it is that was my role was to import, empower my employees. So I gave the idea of like, they're an airplane and I got to make sure that the runway is super smooth so they can just take off. <laughs> That was my philosophical approach. And so then when I was thinking about that, I was like, how can I make sure that happens? And so what I was doing is I would have a blank piece of paper or the whiteboard. I have a line with zero to 10 and I would be like, okay, rate a zero to 10 with 10, you're fulfilling all your potential at this job and zero, you're not fulfilling any of it. 
but at the time, so they would rate, they'd say like, I'm at a six or at a seven. That meant whatever was left over would create pain for them. So everybody, most people in their jobs, they want to feel like they're contributing, fulfilling their potential. So if they're not, something's going on. But originally my intent is I thought it had something to do with work. So if someone said it was a seven, I assumed like, okay, is there something about my managerial style? Is there something about like, we're not providing you the adequate tools? Do you need some additional things in the office? But as I started to do that nine times out of 10, what was creating the cat gap had nothing to do with stuff in the office. It was stuff going on in their personal life. And so then it started to dawn on me. I was like, oh, wait, there, if I could support in whatever way it is, like not in terms of the psychological work of doing psychotherapy, what's going on with your child, how, how did this happen? But in their present, if I can do that, that's going to really help them. And so it was things that were really kind of simplistic. This was back 2005, six, seven, eight. You know, it was like examples of working from home. So a guy on my team has uh, very young children and realize the strain that that puts on someone. And it would be like, Hey, wait, do you want to just work two days from home? And would that be helpful? And it was like, yeah, that would be amazing. And then the impact was now they're happier. They're feeling better about their work, but then also they're going to go through a wall for me personally as their manager, because they know I've got their back. Or maybe it's something else. Like, is there something else that's bothering you? Do you need some resources that is not to do with work about personal life stuff? Uh, or do you even need to just talk about what's going on in that area? So I'm aware and I have that context, or maybe you got to come in later and you'll leave later. It was things like that, but that's not how it started. All it started was that I thought, okay, my job is to empower them. And I was like, what are they missing in the office that I can support them with? Uh, and it turned out that it was not office related stuff that was coming up. Um, and so that was, that was the, the context. Now the, the fo foundational element to be able to do that as a manager are two. The first is you need to be good at your job. Like that was my, if I'm not good at my job, that's not, none of this is going to work because they're not going to see me in that way. And the second, they need to trust me. Right. And so I had invested enough of that, that they knew that, that I had their back. So when I say I had their back, you know, often I would make tough decisions that they were maybe not supportive about, but they knew that fundamentally I was never trying to hurt them. I was championing them in their career. Right. So it wasn't like it was all roses. It was like, there was a lot of time that my team was anti Eric, but I saw that as a good thing. I was like, okay, the guys are, they're bonding. Right. They're like they're bonding around something, but they knew I'm, I'm not there. I'm not trying to hurt them. That was not in my intent. I think that this is what's best for the business. You might not agree, but I'm going with it because that's my job. But so those two elements are the critical piece to the third piece. So it was I was good at my relatively good at my job. They trusted me. And now I could bring in how can I empower them? And originally I thought it would be all work related stuff. And it wasn't. And that's when things started to open up for me, like, oh, wait a second, this is, has a business impact. You know what I mean? So. Do you think there's room in a workplace to expand that conversation? Or do you think it's better to, for managers to get better at what you just described and then create the out, like more access to the outside resources? Because I think the, the question I think comes from a place of, there's all this push for workplaces to be more supportive of employees, mental health and et cetera. But that either means two things or maybe both. That means that the companies or the managers and the leaders have to accept and bring in like- Wait, so one second. Alexa. Sure. Alexa. Yeah. Was that Alexa? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Um, it, so yeah, so it's one of two things. The, the leadership and et cetera has to be willing to make time and maybe pivot a little bit in how they have these uh, performance review discussions or whatever team meeting type of things where they allow a little bit more space for the what's going on in our lives kind of stuff. And also providing 
maybe more effective or more dollars to resources in uh, benefits and employee assistance plans. Um, so yeah, do you think that the workplace is even where some of those conversations should be happening or not? Like, does that make sense? So is it, do we start having those conversations at work or do we just increase funding and space for the go get help here kind of thing? I mean, let, let's think of this purely from a business standpoint for a second. If there was anything, uh, you know, so I worked at eBay Kijiji, which was all one big company. And, uh, you know, I was lucky to be on like leadership track. So we did a lot of leadership training um, and it was pretty high level stuff. It was pretty, uh, pretty great stuff. But the one thing that we would get ingrained and completely ingrained is that people do not leave organizations, they leave managers. People leave managers, right? That's the majority of the reason why people will leave an organization. And so retention is huge. You're putting all this investment in developing this talent. So the outside resource is kind of part of the toolkit, but I would say that the inside stuff is probably most important because if the manager is not doing a good job, so we're not talking about the manager being the, 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 uh, the subordinate therapist, but the manager is not doing a good job of being aware of that aspect of the subordinate's life. Let's call it the interior world. Well, that's gonna be a tough environment to be working in, uh, right? And so again, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting you know, that it's a situation where I'm having problems with my partner, uh, and now because I'm having problems with my partner, you know, I can't, I can't deliver on this project or whatnot. I'm not suggesting that, but just that there's room for those type of conversations because, you know, it brings a certain humanity in the office. And I would imagine what develops is the trust level increase, the happiness level increases. And I think in my, this is just my opinion. There's no doubt. I haven't been in the corporate world now since 2011. It's a long time. But there's no doubt we're moving in a completely different direction, right? That this stuff is inherent. So to have it as an outside piece, as a standalone, I think won't be enough, right? Because if they're not happy internally, right? It's even just about learning to provide space for these difficult conversations, right? Like you're gonna experience anger towards your subordinate and towards the manager. Well, how do you process that? How do you, you know, really do some good conflict resolution or whatever it is, right? But so to answer your question, you need both. And I, but I think the most important one is the one within, because that's where you're going to lose your talent, right? And it's nice to have like all the outside stuff, which is amazing. The kind of Google-esque, we're going to give you the lunch. We're going to give you the perks. That's all good. But I think what people are more after is that certain sense of inner peace and joy, right? That that's not going to come from the outside perks. Uh, so I would say that I would, let's say I were, I am running an organization. I mean, you're in it. And a lot of what I talk about is what I call congruency, right? Just in terms of whatever we're sharing with clients, we're practicing with each other. What it is, what it's like to kind of, if we've got issues of anger or to stay in our integrity, uh, to be direct and honest with each other, right? Because what's what's the use if we're not modeling that, right? Yeah, cool. Okay, that's great and helpful. Uh, so it was a little bit of a side note, as I mentioned. So back to um, you had this moment while journaling, you moved to Montreal. That's actually, can we go there for a little bit? So when you said, I want to go and learn who these two people are. Yeah. That's pretty interesting because um, I, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that as sort of as you grow up, you start to realize your parents are actually individuals in their own whatever. Uh, what, like, how did that come up? Was it just part of your journey of like learning about yourself and et cetera? And, and can you just talk a bit about that? Yeah. I mean, like part of the process was, you know, a lot of anger at, you know, the failings of my parents and, and kind of, you know, wishing things could be different and, and all that stuff had been, been coming up. And, you know, I think it's an important part to be honest about that stuff. Uh, and so I started to be more honest about the reality of my situation, the reality of what I grew up in, um, being honest with them. 
And then after, on the other side of that, just became a, just a curiosity. Like, like who, who are these people? You know what I mean? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was really a fascinating experience because I was there. I hadn't lived at home at that time. It had probably been 10 or 15 years. And, um, you know, it was, it was like, uh, hey, dad, uh, <laughs> how do you go buy clothes? You know what I mean? And, and I mean, that one was a real, uh, real experience for me because he's like, okay, let's go come with me. I will go buy my clothes. And so he, he, I just get in the car. I don't know where we're going. And we go to Walmart. And then, you know, I'm, I'm standing in the aisle and he's like in the clothes section. And I see him like picking up like sweatshirts and looking in the mirror. Like he's not putting it on. He's just holding up in front of himself. And I start to have a tear go down my face because I'm like, this is like my dad. He's just like another person and he's got his own like vanity and he's got his own you know what I mean and it was like so much of that and then you know my mom we would go to a shopping mall and eventually we would just sit down and have coffee and so we would sit and have coffee and just to hear about what it was like with her dad what 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 it was like with her mom and just having these conversation uh, it was just I don't know, it was so fascinate, fascinating. And then my compassion started to, like my compassion for these two human beings started to really like expand in a way that was new for me. And then, you know, with my dad talking to him about, about women and about sex and about like, like the fears and the nervousness and that I carried that as if like, like he had it all figured out and I was somehow flawed in that area, you know, when I was young and growing up. And just to hear the common humanity of like, oh, dad, you went through all that as well. And then starting to realize that it was not only me, it was not only my dad, it's all men. And I'm like, oh, I, I didn't see the world in that way. I just saw it as I was flawed in all these various areas. And I'm like starting to recognize none of this is true. And it, but it starts coming through these original kind of interactions with my my mom and dad hmm. uh, along that line there's a interviewer that i really like he always asks and i want to ask you it because it's along the lines of growing up and family uh who were who what type of person were you in high school like if you were to describe yourself in high school what would that be like like i was it was uh, it, was, it was terrible. I was like, um, uh, so I grew up in Quebec. In Quebec, it was like artists and jocks, but the jocks got no respect. The artists got all the respect. Like the, in Quebec, like in, I noticed in like uh, the rest of Canada, like jocks are on the pedestal. Quebec, it was the inverse. If you had like a, like a two bag where there was like some art in there, like the girls, uh, the, they, they love that stuff. Uh, the jocks were kind of like considered the dummies. And I was in the, the jock category. So I was like in the high school basketball team, that whole thing. But who I was, it was, I was like that veneer gentleman, you know, the overly nice, you know, like soup. So I was like, uh, cause that's where I hid. I hid, I was really afraid to kind of show myself for who I was. So the way I uh, lived in the world is like this gentleman. I wouldn't, I wouldn't drink. I would be the guy that would be like taking care of the other guys. I would be always like very, um, very Mr. Gentleman, you know what I mean? And, and that was a big piece of my work of like getting in touch with my own anger uh, and recognizing that I don't have to hide between the behind the gentleman. Uh, so that's, that's who I was. It was very like polished gentleman guy, always nice. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Okay, so after the six months, wait, that's when you said when you were in Montreal with your parents, you had the sort of <laughs> what sounds like a disappointing realization at the time that you had that was, oh, I, I'm going to become a therapist, basically, right? Is that when it happened? Yeah, there's, there's one, one other thing, like there were two kind of sen seminal moments, right? Because after I left, I was trying to figure out what, what am I going to do? I, I wasn't really sure about what I was going to do. Uh, but at first I was putting a lot of pressure on that. Okay. And I would go to uh, a Starbucks and I would kind of journal and think about it. 
you know, and then, so the two seminal moments was the one I described earlier, that realization that this is probably what I'm good at and what I'm interested in, right? But the one seminal moment that really helped me was that I was in the Starbucks and I was in the second floor and I was journaling. And then I had the realization about value. And I realized there's nothing I can do that's going to make me more valuable than I already am. So, you know, I'll often ask clients, I'll say, if you go to a nursery and there are two newborn kids, which one is more valuable? And right away, they'll say they're equally valuable. And then I say, one of them grows up and is working at Tim Hortons and the other one becomes Bill Gates. Which kid is more valuable? And the ones that struggle the most in their personal lives, they see the Bill Gates as more valuable. That's how I used to be. And I confused intrinsic value with external stuff, right? And so that day in the Starbucks, I realized that there was nothing I can do in the outside world that would make my intrinsic value more. Now, everyone around me could have judgments of me. So let's say I became a billionaire. People could judge, Eric is amazing, he's super successful, but that's their judgment of me. It doesn't increase my intrinsic value. There's nothing I can do in the outside world that will increase my intrinsic value. And when I had that, like literally all the pressure fell off my shoulders because I was like, oh, it doesn't make a difference. I can sit at home and watch TV for the less rest of my life and I'm not more valuable than if, if I built one of the most successful businesses in the world. Everyone around me could say I'm more valuable, but I'm not more valuable. Now, the reason I would do something is because I enjoy it, right? And so I wanna do it for myself. And so that day I closed my book uh, and I openly, I really like sports and I went home and I watched sports for the rest of the day, like videos, this and that. And I felt so good because the pressure was gone. I was like, I don't need to do something. And so that was a really seminal moment for me because then everything started to open up. So that was the precursor. And then I went to Montreal, like then I had the experience in Montreal that I described. And then it was about this idea of being a therapist. But I bring that because that really supported me. It really took all the pressure that it doesn't matter what I do. I can't be more intrinsically valuable than I already am. And so, um, and so then I had the experience and then I wrestled with it in terms of, I was like, yeah, I think this is what I could be really good at. Uh, but I, I wrestled, I was like, I was almost embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be a therapist. There's so much connected with that. Um, and then I just started getting comfortable with it being like, you know what, let's just give this a go. And so uh, I started uh, Googling for universities and schools that I can get into a master's program. And then I found one in Waterloo. I went to the University of Laurier and then I started the, uh, the journey. And did you work anywhere before, uh, like as a therapist before starting MTT? Yeah, not, uh, so what happened was because of my business background in the university, they had a counseling center that they were closing down because it wasn't working. And uh, then the dean of the, 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 the psychology or the department of that school there, uh, he had approached me and he asked me, hey, would you be able to take a look and what you think from a business point of view for this counseling center? Is it? And so I went in and I said, yeah, this thing could be a real success, but uh, there's things that need to be changed. And then he asked, would I be willing to do it? Uh, and then, um, I said, yeah, I would. And so what happened was he kind of gave me the title of the executive director at the time, the counseling center was nothing. It was like the, being the executive director of a, of an empty house, right? So there was no value in it. Uh, but then, uh, we started, you know, implementing some things and it really took off. So we had like 14 therapists, uh, by the time we left, there were like a 
thousand maybe clients, it really started to grow. And then within that context, I was also kind of uh, seeing clients in terms of doing individual intakes, uh, kind of, you know, all that work, getting supervision. So that was the, the beginning of it. Uh, and then I went off to do uh, Men Therapy Toronto. That's um, do you say so? Can, like, what was that process of taking it from what it was to getting it off the ground? Like, was it a student counseling center? Did you say no, it wasn't. It was, no. uh, it was basically the goal of it was for the community, and because the school also wanted to have a place to put its practicum students, mm. right? And it's always the same situation. Like, I get in there and I see the place, it's amazing. It was this beautiful kind of house like a victorian house that had so much character that they had actually put money to make it into a counseling center i, I loved everything about the space it's the classic case that i came in and they just had the wrong people in the wrong chairs like so they're, they're they're getting people to try to do things that they're not supposed to do and then there was zero clarity about what the center was all about like there was zero and so all i started with was we need to be I said, here, this is what's going on in this community. I was in Waterloo. This guy is focusing on this. This is focusing on that. What are we all about? And so that school had kind of a theological, spiritual bent. And so we included that in terms of uh, strengthening emotional and spiritual well-being. And that became the kind of uh, default entry point that if, if you had theological concerns that was connected with, so for example, you're really Christian, and you're struggling with addiction, does that, how does that all work together? And is there a place where I can feel comfortable to bring that and not feel like I have to hide that part of me? And so that was the original process was, A, we got to get super razor clear about what we're all about and what we offer. And then figuring out, okay, so right now in, in today's day and age, you, you got to figure out how to do that online. And so what are we going to do to make sure that that's properly communicated online? And um, yeah, and then we started really doing that. We built a, a website, uh, which I'd actually kind of built from scratch and just kind of got it up going and, and that was it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, but clarity is always a big one, like in terms of, because if I don't understand, you know, if like for me that is like, if I can't get this, how the hell is the other person gonna get this? That was the whole, uh, you know, idea. Yeah. That's quite a unique practicum experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got lucky, yeah. Uh, no kidding. Uh, that's so cool. So maybe uh, let's turn a little bit to the practice and the stuff around men's mental health. Um, yeah, maybe like, what are some more thoughts about the you know, making it more, actually, here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you this question I told you that I got asked yesterday uh, when I was on this, a panel for the, God, I didn't realize, it's a National Students Federation of Canadian Students, High School Students Federation. Um, and they asked me this specific question. Boys are often seen as more tough and strong which leads them to masking their emotions when the topic is brought up. What advice would you give to those experiencing a similar situation? And how have you combated of masking the emotions uh, and issues in your life? So the reason I want to ask you that is because how it relates to the men therapy and, and sort of opening it up to maybe a, an audience or a way of being that hasn't been um, ma like made accessible to something like that. Like, mm -hmm. does that question sort of make sense and how it might relate to the practice and, and what you yeah, were mentioning I think, before? I think it's really an important question, right? Because what's actually being said, at least how I hear it is how do I ensure I don't lose my sense of my masculinity, right? Because that's important. We just can't tell guys, you know, like, it's okay to cry. Like, of course, it's okay to grab, but I mean, what, what, yeah, what, yeah. what the boys are really kind of after, it's like, 
yeah, but I still want to feel that feeling of, of being like a good guy, a good, strong guy, whatever that means for them. And, and I think that's, that's the work because what I see in my practice, and I'm going to try to kind of uh, make it as clear as possible, is I see that we have a lot of people that connect masculinity with patriarchy. So they, they think it's one and the same. So patriarchy is male dominance. And so they start to think that to be a man, what it means is that dominance. So if you want to be dominant in anything, you don't show vulnerability, which is like Michael Jordan is talking about that in the last dance, right? Like from, from that paradigm, you don't show your emotions, you know, uh, you, you like you kind of rage in your anger, right? So we have a whole group of guys that they get confused and they're like, well, wait, that's what I think it means to be a man, but everybody in the world is telling me this is not good, okay? But then we have another group that they're equating patriarchy with masculinity and they're saying patriarchy is bad and masculinity is bad. And they throw all of that out. These are the guys that they don't have any access to their anger. Uh, they're not assertive at all. They engage in a lot of what I call spiritual bypass, which is like they get so spiritual and they say, well, because I'm so spiritual, I don't feel anger or I don't feel any of that, right? And so these are kind of the two extremes. And so for these boys, what we're trying to do is encourage them that healthy masculinity is in the middle, right? So the guy that's not vulnerable, we want him to be more vulnerable. But if he's lacking in assertiveness, we want him to be a assertive, right? And so, or if he's not accessing his anger, we want him to access the emotion of anger, not to act on it, but to be honest that he's feeling that emotion. And we think, or I think, that in the middle is where men we are trying to move through, which is the balance of being strong and tender. Because what I'm hearing in that question is like, I, I'm okay to be tender, but I don't want to lose my strength. And I, and I value, I 100% agree with that. And the way to that is to move from a disempowered stance to a more empowered stance, right? And I would call a more empowered stance seeing masculinity as rooted in love because I see love as being more integrated, more whole. And I don't think of love in a sentimental way. The most loving thing you can offer someone is to be super honest with them and assertive because they know where you stand. That's intimacy, right? Not easy to do, right? The most loving thing to do is if you're engaging in spiritual bypass, to be honest about that and be like, I can't go there anymore. I can't just pretend, you know, just because I'm doing meditation and all this, that everything is perfect. Life inherently is difficult. You're going to have difficult emotions come up. And for us to pretend like that's not the goal of mental health. And I, I, and I, sometimes I, you know, I have to communicate this with clients. The goal is that you're not never going to feel angry. You're not never going to feel sad or grief. The goal is you're just maturing and helping to make better choices and how you respond to them in the future is going to be okay. But I get angry almost every day or every other day. Or like, it's not, right. So I'm not sure if that makes sense, but what I'm hearing in that question is, how can we hold both and encouraging that they're right? We need to model them holding both. Yeah, that's, that's what um, I'm curious where you see the balance between like one thing I did say when in responding to the question was I don't think that the rest, you know, the rest of us, like the average person and caregiver to young boys. Well, I, well, number one, I said there's a lack of good role models in our society, like of like a healthy integrated masculinity in our society for kids to follow, to boys to follow. 
that was one thing I'd said. The other was, I think that we aren't, or we haven't developed the skills to be able to deal with the outwardly sort of aggressive masculine energy. And I don't mean that that's like male specific, like male sex specific, but it tends to come out more in boys and young teens. Um, and so that when, when, uh, if a six, like I think back to myself as a 16 year old boy, if I was trying to express anger and rage and all this emotions that would come up in me, the people around me weren't capable of, of like absorbing that in a tender way and, and allowing it to be and sort of directing me to the emotions. So it would be, no, you're a bad kid. You need to be punished and sort of like disciplined into behaving. Um, and so part of it is on our collective relationship with that anger and that those difficult outwardly aggressive emotions was one thing. Um, and I wonder, well, one, like what do you think about that? And um, yeah, I'll just stop with that. So it was like role models and, and our ability to handle that aggressiveness. Well, I think what you're touching on for me is one of our significant blind spots that we don't recognize. It's just my point of view because we've all come to terms with the fact that, you know, patriarchy, which is male dominance is not where we're trying to go. What we want is gender equality, which is amazing for everyone. But I think one of the blind spots in terms of how we approach this is that we do a lot of work with young girls to kind of promote this idea, right? So to promote the idea of girl power and all that. But the blind spot in my opinion is that we almost imply that these boys know that they're born into a patriarchal history. Like these are young boys. They have no idea of the history that they've been born into. So we just kind of assume that they don't need the support. Like we assume that the girls need the support because we don't want them to get stuck in this old lineage of being put down. So we do a lot of work, which is wonderful. We need to be doing that work. But these young boys have no idea about this cultural lineage that they're coming into. And, but we don't talk to them. We don't talk to them about like, we just assume, well, because they're being born into this society, like they'll figure stuff out. And so they're trying to figure out for themselves without anybody talking to them with no kind of, uh, you know, men or figures that are, you know, open to have the conversation. So they're getting lost. Right. But I think it's our blind spot. We just assume like, what do they know about our history? They don't, they don't, they don't know anything about it. And so who's talking to them about, you know, uh, what it means to be a boy and, 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 and more about the vulnerabilities. We all know what that's like, you know, in terms of not sure if you fit in or not sure if, you know, how that works. And so I think that's one of the big areas in terms of realizing that that's a blind spot for us that we just don't really talk about it. Do you think I was talking to, a, I guess, a friend of mine who's, um, she does a lot of, I guess, healing work. She's not a psychotherapist, but she's like a life guide coach kind of thing. Um, and she was saying, I'm going to interview her too, actually, so I can dig into it. But she says a lot of the, our inability to address well, one, the patriarchal history and sort of the destructiveness of that. And also at the same time, the sincere expression of masculine pain uh, or trauma um, on both ends of the feminine and the masculine. Our inability to address it thoroughly comes from unhealed or wounded uh, like individual and collective um, 
energies like from the masculine and the feminine and so just to preface that in wisdom traditions and most of them are pretty congruent with this masculine energy and feminine energy doesn't mean male sex like biological male biological female uh so these energies are in all of us and the inability i guess this is personal too the inability for us to confront the wounds in others comes from a lack of our own internal healing as well. Does that make sense? That question? Like, I mean, psychologically, the term that we use to kind of express that is intergenerational trauma, right? Which is kind of real. If you do a genogram for most people that come in with uh, any type of trauma, I mean, you'll most likely see it, you know, generations. Um, so I would, you know, I would say that that would make sense, but, you know, understanding that there's inter intergenerational trauma doesn't change the fact that, it, you know, it's an important awareness piece, but then we're the ones, or at least I'm the one that now is in a choice point to start deciding how am I going to deal with this. Right. right. And so then if the more, if people, so I think what the, in the context of the conversation I was having with her, it was, when everyone else is pointing the finger, you know that saying like yeah, when you're pointing the finger. Yeah, yeah. So that's the sort of context of it. Like how do we balance that or how do you see that playing out in terms of like this narrative that and I I see the validity in it, but it's so incomplete. Like boys are taught never to cry. Like I don't actually think that's true all the time. Uh, or, you know, it's not okay for men to express their emotions because they got to pretend to be tough. Like, I don't, I don't actually really believe that totally. Like, I see the historical lineage being passed down where that's almost um, subconsciously a message in like the movies and the pop culture and et cetera. But I, it's so simplistic to me. Like, it can't be that simple. And maybe to add to that, uh, one another thing that you've said that's really landed and stuck with me is the, you know, whatever, 500 years ago, if a man was to be courageous, it's like, here's a gun or here's a sword or here's a whatever, go die in battle, mm -hmm. which is true. I mean, that's our history as a species, really. It was like men were used, well, a lot of men's roles in tribes and cultures was to fight in war. And so they were expendable in some sense. Um, and now, like collectively, if we want this to move forward, there needs to be or some sort of new story. Like uh, Yuval Harari, who's incredibly brilliant guy, the historian, talks a lot about like we're just storytelling chimpanzees, and because we got so good at storytelling, we're able to create these huge collective cohesive societies that build mountain, you know, pyramids and et cetera. So it's a lot of information, but where do you see a connection between our past stories and the need to create a new one for a healthier, more integrated masculinity to emerge? I mean, for me, the way I, I see it, I actually like, you know, you use the, the battle and the courage thing. I actually like the Arabic word, like the Arabic word jihad in terms of its actual meaning is to strive, right? And I see that as an internal dynamic, right? And so for me, that's the goal I'm trying to do with Men Therapy Toronto, right? If, if the men that come in, they really get bought in the idea of striving to be better. But when I mean being better, you know, again, I'm not defining healthy masculinity outside of seeing it as an integration. So most of the men are disintegrated. So some are disintegrated in the sense that they're not asserting themselves. They're not as accessing their anger. They're spiritually bypassing. And so those men, I'm trying to get them more integrated to the more traditional kind of stereotypical, what it means to be a man in terms of, uh, you know, access to your anger. And for the other ones, that are disintegrated on the more stereotypical masculine traits, not wanting to be vulnerable, showing emotions, I'm trying to bring them to the center. And so that for me is the, the courage 
to open myself up and to take a look at my truth, uh, like for myself, I was the guy that was far, far on the side of not accessing my anger and to get real about that and then start changing. That's my personal jihad in terms of really striving to be better. And then in my opinion, that's how the collective starts to change. We have enough of these men who are waking up and really being good, solid, strong, and tender men. But that, that what it looks like, like healthy masculinity is going to have so many different forms of it. It's, it's you know, a guy who's uh, a wonderful pastry uh, chef or uh, a guy that's uh, like a real committed um, um, uh, child take, take care of children in a daycare, right? That, there's so many different elements to it, but for me, it's just about the integration. And as men strive to be more integrated, my feeling is that that's gonna start to change the collective, uh, right? So I don't, I don't really get too sold on these ideas of men don't cry, because yeah, there's a bunch of men, it's the inverse. We, we can't get them right. to stop, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, and, but that's disempowering, right? And so I'm always trying to, and I, I think of, love as the word that represents integration uh and, and kind of daniel siegel in interpersonal neurobiology he he basically says what i philosophically believe in that integration is the hallmark of health uh right and so what i'm seeing is that men are disintegrated and part of that disintegration is because of our history so patriarchy has so negatively impacted women and it's also so negatively impacted men it's a tough thing to live up to, all right? It's literally impossible. You can, but you're going to be devoid of so much opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. And ultimately, what I'm talking about is why I'm encouraging men to go down this route is because it creates a world for them where there's much more opportunity. So living in the world in that patriarchal approach is limited, just as it is limited to kind of live in that world where you're not accessing any of your assertiveness and anger. The other one is filled with opportunity because you feel when you're in that middle place, you feel just as comfortable being with a group of jocks as you would being with a group of people that are traditionally non-stereotypical masculine because it's you're fluid. And so that's how I see it. And, um, and you're fluid while owning the center, like who you are kind of thing. Because as you said that, I, when I think back to my high school days, I was like the chameleon, like the, I'll be whoever I think you want me to be. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hanging out with the gangsters, when I was doing criminal activity, I'd pretend to be like that. If I was hanging out with the artsy kids, I'd pretend to be like that or the jocks or the whatever. So I never had a sense of who I actually was and what the hell I wanted. And so I'm, the question is, do, when you say you can hang out in any of these environments, but you're true to who you are in that, so you're not people pleasing, like you're being uh, like yourself, I guess. Like what 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 would that look like? I guess the the difference between you know the disintegrated chameleon and the integrated person who's flexible to be themselves while in different environments. Like, let's say, for example, often what I'll see in the office is um, the men that are the ones on the side that, you know, they're, they're not accessing their anger, their spiritual bypass. What they'll describe is that if there's a group of more stereotypical, from their perspective, mm -hmm. more stereotypical men, maybe jockey or business oriented, they feel threatened. Like that group is not comfortable for them to, to be associated with that group. So how they'll approach it is they'll just judge the group. So they're not going to notice that that's coming from their fear. And so when the person's in the center, they can be with those men to appreciate what they bring to the table. Like, oh, that's cool. You see work, you see business, like that's cool, your approach. They don't see it as a threat. Right. It's the same thing on the other side. The men who are like traditionally you know, in the more stereotypical uh, fashion, they might be threatened for the guy that really is into musicals 
or 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 art and then they start to see oh wow that's that's real when you're in your center it's like wow that's really really cool it's one of the more beautiful aspects of um of the men's group that i run because often there's going to be the different uh sexual orientations gay men and straight men and one of the things with uh we misunderstand with gay men is that they associate with their gender before their orientation they're men <laughs> that, that's how they see themselves and then there's their their orientation that they're gay men and so usually there would be the gay men who are afraid of the traditionally straight men and the straight men who are also afraid of the gay men and then and gay men and then when they're together and they can see oh shit you, you're basically just like me and they start to appreciate and they're not as scared of each other and i think that happens when you walk into your healthy masculinity none of that matters right like that's that's part of just who who everybody is or who you are and so and i think that's a fun place to be in right yeah that, that that's a great uh, explanation the um I guess we were going, I'm just trying to check the time. Um, I'm curious what you think about the childhood development aspect of all that. So I think I'm it's so fascinating to watch, you know, the mix between uh, conditioning and biological impulse. And so like with my kids, you know, my son is seven and a half, my daughter turns five tomorrow. Uh, and just to see the sort of inclinations towards certain behavior and et cetera. And now as my son becomes probably a little bit more conditioned by society and also just older, I see now in more so than before his like repulsion towards the feminine, maybe that's not the right word, his like pushing away of the feminine quote unquote things um like a good example is last night it's movie night we have movie nights now on friday saturday we used to have it once a week uh and last night my daughter wanted to watch the my little pony movie and over the past couple years my son's been totally open to watching it and admittedly likes it because it's actually kind of a good movie you know whatever but last night he was like adamantly refused to watch the my little pony movie <laughs> And it's just so amazing to watch and like not um, judge him or whatever and like allow exactly. that. Exactly. Not to pathologize that. Yeah, because it's, uh, but that gets pathologized a lot in our current schools and stuff like that. It's like, oh no, Oliver, like it's not okay to say you don't want to watch that because it's feminine. Like, you know, he's just acting out. I guess he's his walking desk. into his, his, his autonomy. He's like starting to walk into what that means for him. And he's going right. to find his way in terms of when he, you know, but I, I would imagine there's nothing to pathologize there. Right, right. Totally. Yeah. So then, because that feeds into a bit of our question before about boys are, you know, seen as tough or whatever. And when they act that way, it's not good or not right. Uh, and so in some ways, you know, we don't want to let that turn into talk like unhealthy masculinity or the toxic patriarchy, as you would say. So where's the, like the balance there, as you would say, in terms of seeing clients and men now, and maybe also boys sort of allowing them to explore that territory, but not encouraging it to get unhealthy or unbalanced. Does that Kind of makes sense that question like i mean that's a lot of the work that i do i mean uh you know i i can't tell you how many times in my office i have to let clients know that anger is healthy like that's almost like it's surprising to me but i have to clarify it's healthy because it's just an emotion right and i tell them all the time if you came in and you told me you were feeling joy i would never demonize you feeling joy we don't even know where emotions actually come from you know what i mean and so and so it's it's really important to, to a normalize the experience of the emotion and the feeling and for them to get comfortable but yeah i'm angry and it's okay to be angry now we have to do that work connecting that feeling and emotion doesn't give you permission to act on it in a way that's unhealthy so if a general uh, general theme is that someone feels the emotion of anger and goes to rage well no the behavior is the problem 
So we need this is like I do a lot of work just disconnecting behavior with emotion. Uh, but then, you know, I tell them all the time, like sometimes when I'm feeling super angry and I just have it in me and I, I can't, I don't know what to do with it. I'll be in a, in a, like a safe room that's, you know, closed and, and, and I'll just drop a very loud F-bomb and just to have that emotional mm -hmm. release, but I'm not hurting anybody, right? And so, and then I could start doing the work about what is this all about? What, what am I hearing? Like, what's the message I'm hearing? Uh, what does my anger want to say? And what am I taking on about myself? And is that something that's familiar to me? And then I start going into the work. Do I want to do something to change that narrative? Um, but yeah, and so same thing with boys. You know, their anger, their aggression, it's all healthy. Now, it's not permission to be acting on it. And that's where we need to do the work. But the fact that they're feeling it is should be super encouraged, I would think. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, not, it's, it's not a invitation to act on it in unhealthy ways, I think is the, is a nice one there. Um, yeah, because we get in trouble where people have been gotten co conditioned that anger is bad, but anger is an emotion. So no emotion is bad. You just accept that you're experiencing the emotion. Now, the behavior connected to the emotion, that could be a problem. Whether you're passive aggressive and not speaking your truth, or whether you're raging out and trying to control someone with your anger, problems. But those are behaviors. Uh, anger is not bad, it's healthy. For all people, for women included. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think women would really benefit touching, getting, you know, touching or getting access to that anger. Yeah, there, as you were describing that, getting into a safe room, so to speak, of the um, one, my meditation teacher, uh, who's an incredibly wise human being, uh, was telling us a story of, we were talking about anger, and she told us a story of, she got, you know, she received an email um, that was something that was very, uh, she didn't like obviously like so it was like hurt her like it made her angry it was like how the hell could this person write this to me you know and she just described how she handled that right because there's like the beautiful thing for me and I think a lot of people with meditation again and it touches on what you said before about like we're not you mentioned it like emotions are just there and they're, it's, you know, it's, they, and it's never, it's never going away. There's no field of roses that one day you're going to do enough therapy, enough meditation that you're going to be walking around like this saint or Dalai Lama. It, it ain't happening. And I would wish people would really kind of embrace that. You know what I mean? Uh, you will learn to deal with it better. So that's good. But, uh, you know, that's the spiritual yeah. bypass I'm talking about. Right, like right. someone significant close to the family dies and you're like, oh, well, this is the universe it's meant to be. Uh, yes, but you're probably feeling something associated with that. You might not be, but I would expect you're feeling some real pain. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That That's a nice example of the, <clears throat> even, you know, the Dalai Lama gets asked often, like those similar questions. He's like, of course I get angry. Like, what do you mean? I don't have like, oh yeah, I get angry all the time. But he's like, there's the biggest country, you know, population wise in the world. They're trying to kill me at every, yeah. you know, they want me dead. Uh, you know, and my he whole. Gets, he gets horny too. He's got a sexual yeah. energy as well. You're right, <laughs> you right, know right, what I mean? Right, like, yeah. it's not like, he's just a regular, normal dude. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a really, like, that's a hard one to grasp, I think, for a lot of people is the. Um, yeah, back, so back to that story. So she was telling us the story, getting the email, and she said she was in her car driving maybe to like the, the group, and she just like let out the rage. She was just like, my fucking son of a fucking yeah, right? Like, and she's describing it to us, and she's like, that's me processing anger. It's like not like, like perfectly to what you said, nobody's immune to this stuff, and we have to learn to allow it to be because it's okay as long as we're not hurting other people in the expression of it and et cetera. Exactly. Once we disconnected the behavior and then we could really accept, I, I would say that's probably the most important part to accept. I'm feeling angry and no judgment or as best you can do. It's just an emotion. 
If you were having this wonderful day and you were feeling so happy and joyful, you wouldn't be judging yourself for feeling that way. You would just kind of accept it for what it is. And same thing with, with anger. And then from that place, you do what she did, your spiritual the meditation or my approach or anyone's approach. And then you get to make a more calm, how do I want to deal with this? And it's hard work. It's not easy. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, is there any other, uh, I'm trying to think of I'm looking at the clock. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like what, what would you see as a, um, an ideal, well, ideal, I don't know, uh, progress towards integrating sort of the masculine energy. I mean, we've talked about it a lot, so I, I don't want to like come up with a question that is already, we've already discussed, like, as you see, hmm, actually, let's use a current example in the world, like with what's going on with um, the, the COVID-19, Oh, this is good. This is a perfect around the uh, the masculine slash feminine energy. So uh, maybe it's out of context. The it seems so. Depending on who you talk to, a lot of people will say there's been a bit of an overreaction to what we've done, and that may. I don't know if that really connects to. I'm totally like lost in how to frame this question in the context of what we've been talking about but yeah like what I'm so fascinated about is how individual psychology is a great example of this collective thing that's happening so right now maybe there's a ton of fear going on and we are reacting to it however we are uh, the dominant process has been overprotection i think um that's my perspective and how might that relate to an individual who's caught in like a like a difficult spot in their personal lives like i i'm having a hard time really hard time framing this question like i don't i mean I, i'm I'll go with it where, you know, just feels resonant for me, you know, because for me, my whole philosophical approach is that an individual's life is their opportunity to experiment, right? So the way I look at my life is that my life, you know, I'm the kind of quote unquote scientist in the sense, and my life is the experiment. And what a scientist does with experiments is you're, you're testing for different results. Uh, right. And so, you know, I would encourage men, women, you know, we're going through what we're going through, but there's going to be emotional responses that everybody individually is going through as a result. The hallmark of psychotherapy is ultimately creating greater awareness so an individual could make a more optimal choice. I can't stress that enough, that an individual's life will not change without making a different choice. What we do with psychotherapy is we help to see increase the awareness because they not, might not be seeing that they're making their choices from a limited vantage point, right? Where we get all the information to increase someone's awareness is through emotional awareness. So people now are going to have emotional responses to what's going on. Some might be so much joy, they're loving it. Some might be fear. Some might be anger. Well, now that's a gateway for each of those people to learn about themselves and to experiment. Well, what do I want to do with this? Because you can have anger about the fact that what is this? This is ridiculous, so stringent. And then you could use that to rage. You can go on social media, you can do this, but 
that's not going to support you. Or you could say, okay, I have anger. I can feel the anger. This really pisses me off. And then you move into, okay, wait, I don't, I don't agree. But I appreciate that that's your point of view and it's different from mine. And now from that place, I'm going to be an activist and saying, hey, I appreciate that point of view, but here's my point of view. And I think this is the healthier way to approach it, right? So now you've taken that anger, you've kind of acknowledged it. You're not going to act on your anger, but you're going to respond to it. And maybe the response is a certain form of activism, but it's not making the other person wrong. It's just saying that's a different perspective. That's the one with the anger. The one with the fear, well, they're going to have to process that and how they're going to process that. So my, my big thing is that, you know, this is an amazing opportunity to experiment with, with some stuff in your life, right? So you're feeling feelings, they're coming up uh, and they're gonna be uh, an opportunity to you to see, well, what do I wanna do with how to deal with this? And I don't think there's any real right or wrong. It's just, you kind of test out, you see the results. Um, but that's, that's how, I mean, that's how I'm approaching it personally. Yeah, that was great. Actually. Um, that helps me to be like, just bring a bit more clarity to me because I, there's such a gap in our societal discourse around anything difficult, really, because it's either, it's like, seems to be the two ends of the spectrum that you were kind of pointing to. And um, it's a nice reminder that if we, can process our own experience with it and then use that as a tool to either take action and be an advocate or just to allow it to be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, yeah. Cause yeah, it's all, you see the, even you see the, it's been circling around a lot later, like how to talk to your friend who's, uh, sharing conspiracy theory uh, videos. Have you seen these yet? There was like a big headline in one of the newspapers like uh, how to talk to your friend who's sharing or who believes in the conspiracy theories around, etc. And to me, it's such a lack of validation for people's fear and paranoia and etc. And it also uh, carries the connotation of like a condescendent i'm superior like we're superior to you how dare you like it's so unhelpful like i don't know and maybe am, am i being naive to think we should be able to on a societal level like have more space for that kind of stuff well i, I mean the way i operate if personally is that i just take it back to me Right. So I'm not I'm not trying to my, my philosophical approach is that if I really do a good job of changing me, then it will have an impact. So in this example, OK, well, you don't agree with, let's say, that guy's point of view. Right. So you guys are actually on the same page because he doesn't agree with your point of view. So you're 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 more you're more common than you are. You're more alike than you are disalike. So now if you could sit in that, you don't have to demonize him. And you could decide, do I want to share my thoughts on this? But not because I want to make the other person wrong, but because I think this is an important message that I want heard, right? That, that changes the whole dynamic because you're not fighting with anybody. You're not trying to change anything. You're just putting yourself out there. Or you could do what you said earlier, be like, oh, I don't agree with him, but that's his position and I'm just going to let it go, right? Uh, but that's how I... I usually will always take it back to, you know, trying to change me. Right. That's also a good example of the, how, uh, I don't know if congruence is the right word, like the uh, process of an individual working through difficult things. In some sense, it's the same as us doing it collectively, right? Because we're just a bunch of individuals processing things individually and that comes out in a collective discourse. Um, yeah, because I would, I would imagine that's what is meant by, you know, increasing consciousness. All right, so I can't, I can't increase consciousness. Like, for example, I'm a therapist and I have a specialty. 
you know, I don't increase consciousness by, uh, you know, going out there and giving talks. That might kind of give someone an idea, but fundamentally I increase consciousness by increasing it in myself, right? And then, so that that's the first step. And then if someone else decides, then slowly, but my work is always going to be for me to increase it in myself, all right? That's going to be where my energy is. And then I, in my case, as a psychotherapist, I share what I can, but as like, not with the attachment. This is just an op- offering. If, if you think this is helpful for you, try it out. And if they do do the work, then their consciousness increases if it's resonant. And then with time, you know, I would imagine it'll be a better environment for everybody. Cool. Okay. Um, that's a good, oh, that echo keeps coming through. So I try to, the, um, so what would be some ideal or some interesting things moving forward like uh so one obviously you know you continue to practice um you have the clinic going um what might be some other interesting ways of bringing this conversation more outward into into our collective uh consciousness i guess like the the stuff around masculinity and patriarchy and because it's there's i yeah, think no, there's a, a huge void of of a sincere conversation around this so what i think we've yeah. talked about a bit some but no i mean it's doing the it's doing the thought talks and getting out there and and doing all that stuff i think is really important in my uh, opinion for me personally it would be great if i did more of it because i would like to do it and i'm interested in the the topic uh, but what I was trying to uh, suggest earlier was that having the talk and someone looking at the talk is not going to change them, right? It's going to open them to some ideas, but then they're going to have to decide to do the work, right? And so once they do the work, that's going to change the consciousness. But how they get triggered for the idea is to start these conversations. And if there's anything, you know, when I see a man in my office, I think one of the things I try to impress the most is the idea, as long as they just buy in, that alone they cannot change, right? And I tell them, it's not me as a therapist. It doesn't have to be a therapist. It could be a really good friend who you're super honest with, but you cannot change alone. And I use the metaphor of connecting shame with a fish born in polluted water. And I tell my clients, that's what shame is like. If a fish were born in polluted water, that fish would be unhealthy, but would have no way to know that the reason it's unhealthy is because of the water, because that's all it knows. It would need someone else to come and tell the fish, hey, you're swimming in polluted water, you need to get out. And that's what most men are doing, that they're carrying such intense shame-based beliefs that it's been with them for so long that they can't even see it and there's going to be no way for them to change their life without the support of someone again doesn't have to be a professional therapist but they if they're not brutally honest with another human being it's going to be so hard for them to see that they're operating in a polluted water in this case it's going to be some recurring thoughts and themes and so that's the biggest piece that if we can get men to buy in, you just, this idea of the Marlboro man or whatnot is just gonna get you living in the world as if it's a mosquito banging up against the window and doing it over and over again, trying to get to a different place. It's not gonna happen. And so if there's anything, anyone who's listening to this, is there any man, like just real, you just can't do it alone because you can't see what you can't see. Um, I know for me personally, that was a hard pill to swallow, right? Because I was a heady guy. I felt like, you know, I could understand things. Yeah, I could understand things, but there was so much I couldn't see. And then only when I started connecting with other people that I noticed, oh man, there's a lot of emotions I don't like having. So I prefer running up in my head, Uh, but this is a problem. It's not gonna support me. Amazing, that's awesome. And you also use the, the analogy of shame uh, likes to hide, and, That's a, and the only way to bring it out is through to come others. 
Yeah, it's, it's got to come out of hiding. Right. Amazing. Um, anything else you want to uh, mention before we say goodbye? No, no, that's, <laughs> I guess that's a good first, uh, first start. Yeah, I agree. That was really great. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe just, so can you just uh, list off the website and yeah, so it's where uh, people can find out more it, about. Yeah, so Men Therapy Toronto. It's Men Therapy Toronto, all three words together, uh, dot com. And, uh, you know, now we're more active on social media. So you'll find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn. And, um, yeah, we do a lot of work also around uh, sex and porn addiction. We didn't talk about it today, but that's just a big avenue in terms of where guys are struggling. And so uh, we do a lot of work there as well. Cool. And all that stuff will also be in the show notes of the podcast so people can find it there. And uh, okay, great. So until next time, um, thank you so much for your time and your Thanks, insights Mike. and, and yeah. info. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. We done?